Okay. Welcome back to Culture Your Creative. Thank you for joining in. Uh, essentially, this is a platform that allows me to have a conversation with incredible people that do amazing things. Um, and hopefully that you can learn some really important things that you could take away and implement into your life. I'm the host, Luke Gledhill. I run a brand development agency called Just Up The Road that helps people, brands and companies really uh, portray their brand message, their story, their narrative to the end personal citizen. I also host the 21st Club Think Tank that brings together people that do good and give back through social, spiritual and environmental initiatives. So today, um, we have the human performance specialist, Paul, my good friend of mine. So I'm really excited to, to have this conversation with him. Let's bring Paul in. Hello, Paul. Hey, mate. How's it going? Good to see you. Thank you for your time, Paul. I truly appreciate this. Um, as I mentioned on the, on the short intro, you and I met, uh, it was... A good few years ago now, I was at an event that you, you spoke about, uh, spoke at, and I was instantly drawn to this incredible knowledge, a wealth of knowledge that you have when it comes to human capabilities, mind, our brains, um, what our bodies are capable of. And it just it all completely blew my mind. And since we've got to know each other a little bit more, very fortunate that you've actually spoken at a previous event that I hosted as well. Mm -hmm. So um, give us a, just tell us who you are and currently a brief overview of what it is you, you do. Yeah, yeah. So I, I have a company, it's a health company that um, it's called Altus Health and it manages people's health. And my background is sort of very eclectic. And so I had a lot of these different experiences. Um, I was an adventure athlete and I did 500 to 1,000 mile races through deserts and jungles. And I learned a lot about kind of the human body and the capability. I got a master's degree in human performance. Um, so very science focused. But then also I go and live with different indigenous tribes around the world and sort of embed myself with them and see how they live. And sort of the the juxtaposition between our Western civilization. And so I kind of piece all those aspects together and it formulated a very unique sort of perspective that I have on health and longevity and well-being and, and you know, human performance in general. You know what I find really interesting and I forgot and I'm glad you mentioned it, the fact that you spent time with indigenous people in, in different areas of the world you know, I've been researching and reading up uh, on on different things with regards to that and watching things as well. And it's almost as if over the years, that's kind of, oh, look, there's a documentary about indigenous people and look how they w live very strangely and, and completely, it's almost completely foreign to our life, right? That you right. can't comprehend. Right. But with everything that we've gone through in the last four or five months this year, and the shift in the mindset of a lot of people have had with regards to health and wellness. Then you look back to how indigenous people live. Actually, we're the ones that are kind of look weird, and they're the ones that have actually got a lot of the things right. Could you, can you elaborate a bit more on, on what you found? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And it, you, you hit the nail on the head there. It's, you know, it's, if you think of you know, humans, we have something that's called biogenic traits. And they're traits that every human shares, no matter where you are on the planet. And it's this sort of coding that we inherited from our ancestors from Paleolithic times. And they're things that have kept our species alive and thriving. And so it's like my desire for high caloric foods, my um, want to bond in a tribe because I'm, I'm stronger in a group than I am individually, the, the, the desire to reproduce that keeps our species growing. These are biogenic traits, and we all share them. But what's interesting is that the way we're controlled by them, the way they manifest in us is through feelings of comfort or discomfort. That's our puppet string. So if, if our... Um, biogenic trait. If, our, if, if something's good for our species, we get a pleasure response to it. And if, we, um, if there's something that's potentially dangerous for us, we get a negative feeling, a discomfort. And this developed, you know, like I said, over thousands of years. Now, what happened? Our modern civilization came along and goes, wait a minute, we don't really like those feelings of discomfort. So let's create solutions for them. Let's produce things that give us pleasure. And let's get rid of anything that gives us discomfort. You know, a little example is like 
air conditioning in our house. We have a set point, which is called homeostasis, this balance of temperature and minerals in our body when everything's a balance. If we vary from it, if we go outside and we feel a little chilly, we get discomfort because the body's saying, hey, if you get too cold, I might not be able to keep your core temperature up and it may be dangerous for you. So we created air conditioning, we created clothing, we created you know, blankets to wrap ourselves in. The same with food. We get a feeling of discomfort when we don't eat, we don't have food around us, you know, to motivate us to go and get food. And then now in civilization, we've created this abundance of food. The access to food is very, you know, easy now, you know, with refrigeration to keep food preserved, restaurants, food delivery, all that stuff. It's a reaction to this coding. But this coding doesn't really fit our civilization now. But it does fit these indigenous cultures because they're still living by it. So if you think of this coding like, you know, um, as an animal, we're not that strong compared to a lot of other animals, meaning we don't have like armor, built in horns. We don't have a shell for protective gear. We can't spit poison. You know, we just got our, you know, our hands and, and, and our strength compared to other animals isn't great. So if you think if we're sitting in our tribe, we're bonded together and now we have to go get food. If we don't have a strong motivation, we just sit there and wither away. We're like, oh, I'm not leaving the cave. You know, it's a bit dangerous out there. So we have to get a very strong feeling of discomfort and equally a very strong sensation of reward when we do get to food. And so that's, you know, we're still living with that coding, but we don't realize it's subconsciously controlling us. So it's the reason that we go and binge on pizza or we go to the fridge to overeat. So we're, like you said, we're the ones that aren't living the way our bodies are designed. We're living in this in the world where our DNA hasn't been updated. It's still version, you know, 1.0 when we, you know, lived in these, you know, nomadic, you know, out in, in nature. What I find really interesting, I find it all really interesting, Paul, but above all else, what I do find interesting and what you particularly call out is that our body and minds are coded back in history, yet the way we live and the way society or also the system structures is set up, if you look back through the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s to where we are now, and you can see the development of comfort, of ease, of moving away from discomfort, which are all of the things that you've explained, do you think that big companies, big food conglomerates, they, they know how to play the system, to manipulate, to really kind of keep people in that really mindset? I think absolutely. Whether they consciously know or not, that's what they do. So if you think, like, uh, look at our senses. So we see color because we're fruit predators, right? So we can see when the fruit is ripe. We also have a... Um, we're now over time, we, we have um, one of our biogenic traits is the, 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 the joy of the smell of cooked food. We also love um, fat, anything high caloric fat. We love glucose, carbohydrates, and we love sugars. So if you think of a very famous um, burger company, has the right amount of fat, <laughs> has sugar, has the right amount of salt, is wrapped in a yellow or red package, and uh, it pumps out pheromones. And so it's almost irresistible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's crazy to think, really. Um, look, I, you know, as you were speaking earlier, I was thinking yesterday, I was very grateful I had the opportunity to spend some time and put in a, a shift at a farm out near mm. Santa Barbara. And it was incredible to be alongside the, the person that owned the farm. He'd been doing it for seven years now. And to listen to him and talk with him specifically about what the ground is providing us oh, and amazing. how seasons work within the food, right? Which goes against what we currently have in society, mm -hmm. which is we can access any food at yeah. any time, which is not how uh, we are built, really. And so when we, when we think about... I mean, you can talk a lot better than this than what I can, but when, you, when we talk about circadian rhythms with what our body is used to, the change of seasons and how food plays a role in that, 
-hmm. The farmers know because that's their livelihood. And, and we, I had a great conversation with them yesterday about how the food changes with the season, but yet people don't understand that. When the food changes and he can't supply strawberries any longer because the, you know, the weather's changed for whatever reason, mm -hmm. people still want strawberries, totally. but he's trying to supply squash or whatever, you know? Yes, exactly. Can you yeah. talk a bit about, uh, about that? Yeah. Um, you know, we grew out of nature. So like I said, those biogenic traits, they developed um, as nature developed. So we're one and the same. Our civilization, part of what it did, it pitted us against nature. So we're like, oh, you know, there's nature out there. We're going to build these little boxes and separate ourselves. You know, we have windows so we can still look at it, but we don't want to, you know, get involved in it. And that's, you know, not what's really good for us. It's like you said, this, the, we have this rhythm that we live by, circadian rhythm. And that's a daily rhythm, and it's triggered by light. There's one interesting thing I was working with, um, you know, on, on this panel um, with uh, some think tanks for um, space travel. And one of the biggest issues they were dealing with was going to planets that have a different um, length of day. And it was only one or two hour difference, but, but the astronauts would have only lasted a year, year or so um, with, with that, that change in circadian rhythm. rhythm. That's, That's how, how dependent, dependent we are on it. But, but we have this, now, now we have artificial lighting, lighting so, so we're, we're staying out of the sequence. sequence. It's, it's the same with food. When, when I prescribe diets, diets and my programs, what we prescribe is usually a year program, um, because, because of all the these cycles that happen throughout the year, we, we want to be able to address them all. And one, one of them is the, that cycle of not, not only types of food, but the, the amount, amount of availability of food. Of food. And, and, you, you know, know, obviously it depends where you are, are you know, your, 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 how far you are from the equator. equator. You know, the, 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 the lucky group that's, that's around the equator, equator you know, the seasons, seasons don't change. change. So they, they have the same food the whole time. time. But, but if, if you, you go further and further away from the equator, equator there's stronger and stronger seasons. seasons. And, and so what our bodies used to do naturally was sort of build up fat, you know, and store fat throughout the summer. And until, until we, we got, got to fall and then into winter, where we would have sort of more like a, uh, an animal that would hibernate. And so we'd, we'd go through this cycle where we build up these fat stores and then we utilize them. them. And, and that's really good for the body to go through that cycle. But, but what, what we're trying to do is, is, is maintain, maintain a certain level, you know, not only with my body weight, but also with, you know, the types of food I'm having. We want that consistency, you know. Um, the, the, other, the other thing that we do is, we have now, now made mealtime an adventure, adventure right? right? It's, it's like, oh, well, I'm going to have, you know, food from Japan, Japan or India or Italy. Or Italy. And, and we're going through this adventure and we're like, like you know, I, I love this food. food. I don't like this food. food. Whereas, you know, we, we're not really eating what's well, good, good for us now. And, and you, you know, know, this farmer could probably tell you, you know, if you look at um, since the, the invention of agriculture, what's, what's happened to our food is incredible because... We are conditioned for when, when, when it comes to, 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 to fruit, to, to, to sweet things, right? And because of that, what, what's happened over time is that um, the, 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 the varietals of fruit that aren't as sweet have sort of been wiped out. I don't think there's any foods now that are indigenous. They've all been manipulated somehow, you know, to grow the sweetest varietals, the biggest varietals, the more colorful ones. So, so the bitter, bitter food we're sort of losing a taste for. And, and that's, that's why, you know, there's that, that, that separation between people saying, oh, you know, are you being healthy? healthy? You're just eating kale, you know, because you don't like the bitter fruit. And, and so it's finding, it's, it's, it's really settling down into the, that natural rhythm of the circadian rhythm of the day or the seasonal rhythms. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really mind-blowing and it's a science within itself. And I can, as you were talking about that, I can see how... A lot of people will not want to be involved in that or not want to try to think about that and are quite happy with convenience and to be able to eat whatever is processedly made, um, which is not nutriently dense and not good for their system. Um, there was I've been watching this series on Netflix uh, called Down to Earth, and they travel different parts of the world. There's a chap called Darren Oles in it um, who's a superfood guru and there was something that really stood out when they when they landed in Europe and they were they were in France 
he got out the car that I think they'd taken the channel tunnel underneath the water, got out the car, took his shoes and socks off and then got on the ground with his, you know, on his on his hands and his feet and just felt that kind of the energy from the land because he was in a different part of the world and he wanted to feel connected with that. And a lot of people might see that as, well, that's a really weird thing to do. And since everything that's been going on, I've he heard it more and more from spiritual teachers and different people saying, just get out into land, into the earth and the soil and the grass or the beach or, and just yeah. be, you know, what, what, can you talk a bit more about what yeah. that connection does? You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's, you know, it's, it's a practice. That, there's two practices. One that you're describing is called grounding. And I actually recommend it to my clients when they travel through time zones. I'm like, as soon as you can, get out in nature, take your shoes off and get on the ground. Because everything in our universe at its base is, has atoms. Yeah. So if it's living or dead, it has an atomic structure. So if you think of humans, we're 57 trillion cells. In each cell, there's at least two molecules. And in each of those molecules is a thousand, uh, sorry, a trillion atoms. So a lot, right? Atoms have a core that's positive and an electron that's negative. And so that's essentially a battery. So really we're trillions and trillions of batteries. Air, two molecules of oxygen. Also atomic structure, ground the same way. So it's this energy that's, that's flowing constantly. Our senses just aren't that great, you know, because we can only see a short spectrum of light. So we can't see anything of a certain size either. So we don't see atoms, but we can experience it. There's a practice in Japan called Shinrin Yoku, and it's called, it's just forest bathing. So it's getting out of nature and it's actually prescribed by psychologists to get out of nature because we're so disconnected for it. But what's happening is that when we get stressed, we lose these negative electrons, which means we become positively charged. Nature has abundance of negative um, electrons. So we pick those up and that's why we feel balanced. And if you're around nature, forests are great for it or nature that's moving. So like um, a, a waterfall or the, the white water of a wave that charges up more and we can pick them up. And so that's why you might feel very relaxed or balanced when you go into nature. So that's, I don't mean to make a joke of what you just said, but I was just <laughs> picturing hugging Hugging a tree. <laughs> yes. Yes. No, there's something to it. We can see, you know, with science, it's interesting because it takes so much to prove something. It's very expensive. If, if you're like, if you, if you had a theory, Luke, and you're like, hey, I believe this. Now, for me to validate that, I need to do a, a research project. So I got to get lots of funding. I got to get lots of scientists and I got to, you know, research. And then we got to validate that you know, the size of the control group I might have to ex uh, expand. Anyway, that often takes years and years and years. And for me to, for me to spend money to research your theory, I would have to have a, 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 an investment. In it. So some outcome that I can make my money back or make a profit on it. So science actually moves very, very slowly. But we're just starting now to catch up with this idea. You know, quantum physics actually helped a lot because it's a subatomical particles. And so we're now starting to understand or, or theorize on what's going on below the atomic level. And so science is actually catching up with uh, spirituality, with all these things. Like when I'm in the jungle, you know, they do these energy ceremonies and stuff, which you can feel it. Like, you know, there's something going on, although you can't see it. So I can't tell. They're like, oh, we're doing this energy work. I'm like, mm, OK, you know, I can feel it, but I can't experience it through my senses. But now science is starting to catch up because we're creating tools that are better than our senses. And we're able to start measuring this. I think, you know, in the, in the very near future, I think we're going to have massive advances in understanding what this energy work's doing and be able to measure it in a, in a much more um, kind of vis visceral way. Yeah, I, I actually really enjoy and get excited by quantum physics. I can't say that I understand it truly, um, but I'm learning and, and I've read a lot about it, particularly Dr. Joe Dispenza. He's got yeah. some really good books and, and talks very well about quantum physics mm -hmm. and really how that relates to brain waves, um, 
manifestations, uh, everything that we put out into the universe, essentially, you know, the age old saying about where your uh, but energy flows, your, your focus goes, you know, and, and but, 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 if, but it's all true, right? A lot of people would yeah. say that's old woo woo, but now it really is coming into play a lot more. Now, now we can measure. So a thought is an electromagnetic signal, right? And we can now measure them one foot off your head. So we have these helmets, these machines that can actually um, measure thoughts. And what's interesting, there are animals who can detect electromagnetic signals. So sharks, piranhas, they can tell whether you're sending out a calm vibe or a stressed one. So if you get in a pool of piranhas and you're, and you're super chill, they're not going to bother you. But as soon as you get nervous or panic, it, you send out these signals of fear it says to the piranhas that you're in a vulnerable state, and so they'll attack you. So they could, they're actually measuring electromagnetic signals. Wow, that's incredible. As so, you were so talking- if, you, so if, you're swimming, if you're swimming with piranhas, just be super chill, okay? Yeah, I, I'm not <laughs> sure actually I'd like to swim with piranhas. <laughs> you don't want to test the theory? <laughs> no, that would be a no. As you were talking actually, I just remembered you've done some work with Wim Hof. Uh, I'm a yes. big fan of Wim Hof and, and yeah. breath work. Uh -huh. Do you want to talk a little bit about breath work and, and what that yeah. does for your mind and body? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Wim, Wim's a he's crazy guy. Great. What he's, what he's brought, sort of this, this a reawakening of breath is amazing. Because you know, it's, it's very ancient. These, a lot of cultures, thousands of years old, have been working you know, with, with breath work. And so it's great that he sort of re-sort of energized it. Um, but there's several things happening when it comes to breath work, um, which, you know, a lot we don't fully understand yet, but it does. There's, a, there's a, a lot of shift in the mental state. And this is where, you know, science sort of having trouble right now understanding it because we can shift our mental state that way. So our brain works in four main uh, wavelengths. So uh, beta, alpha. Um, theta, delta, delta is being sleep. And so we can actually breathe at a certain rhythm and it shifts the wavelength of our brain. So there's a breathing style called uh, box breathing. And it's just, you know, inhale a certain rhythm, hold for the same time, exhale for the same time, and then inhale for the same time. And you just keep going in that. And that rhythm um, tells our parasymp parasympathetic nervous system that we're safe, we're calm, and so the brain wavelength can drop and the brain follows rhythms. I don't know if you've ever done um, any ceremonies, indigenous ceremonies, but they often have rattles or drums and they may not know what's exactly happening, but the brain follows rhythms. So if I um, was drumming and I had a pretty fast rhythm and then I started to slow it down, the brain will follow that rhythm and slow down. It'll actually drop into a state of state, which is a subconscious state. So you know, hypnosis, they do this, they talk. And when I, when I guide meditations, I do it. So I'll start talking and the ends of my word will start to get slower and drop off. Like you're feeling very relaxed. And what I'm doing, I'm actually shifting your brain from this state when it's very focused to this more relaxed state. And so breath work, that's what it's doing. It's sort of shifting you um, energetically, um, the brain wavelength, but it's also cathartic. So it's also purging. And this is another thing that we haven't really caught up um, with science. Um, we hold on to energy. So we're um, electrochemical beings, right? So, so we have these chemicals, our hormones, you know, all these different chemicals flooding our bodies. And we have this electricity, right? The bio, uh, biomagnetic stuff. And that's what our body's made up of, you know, on, a, on the atomic level. And so we're this vibrating matter. And there's something that happens when we get stressed or something triggers us or upsets us, we somehow hold on to that energy. And so doing breath work, you can do very big breathing. You can actually shift that energy and you can feel calm and relaxed. It's almost, it's purgative. Now on a, on a physiological level, what's happening, you're hyper oxygenating the blood and you're, you know, also conditioning. There's, um, when, we, when, when we're exercising, we run out of breath. It's not because of a lack of oxygen. It's because of buildup of carbon dioxide. And so 
by doing this heavy breathing, you're actually conditioning your body to be able to handle that transition of gases much better. And so that's when, when Wim talks about his benefits, that's what he focuses on mostly. But there's so many with the shifting of the brain, the physiological adaptations, and the releasing of, of energy. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I, I actually did a proper breath work ceremony, uh, I think it was a month, two months ago now, and, and that was my first time. It was a long period of time, uh, highly oxygen, oxy, oxygen. Holotropic, holotropic breathing. I'm, it could have been. I'm not yeah. 100% sure. I'll have to look that up. But what I do know what happened was that yeah. you, when you talk about the release of energy, um, yeah. my, my hands and arms actually froze, kind of like they call it the lobster or the, or the crab yeah. claws. Yeah. And yeah. Th there was just waves of emotions coming out. And mm -hmm. th the energy was leaving, like you said. And, and it got to a point and a state at, towards the end where I just – at a point where I felt like nothing actually really mattered. It was really yeah. quite uh, uh, an amazing experience. Yeah, it, it sounds like holotropic breathing, which um, was um, developed from, from Stanislav Graf, um, who is this Hungarian researcher. And what they're finding now, which they didn't know then, there's a, um, a part of the brain is called a default mode uh, network. And this is where... Um, if, if, if that part's very rigid, um, you, you get stuck in your belief and stuff. And that's where who you are or identity sort of manifests. That's what you know, they're, they're thinking. But when you do this breathing, um, the same with breathing and deep meditation, that part of your brain actually lets go. So what happens is your identity lets go. Your identity is really making you as an individual. and so. Well, people have this experience when they meditate, when they um, do breath work, or even when they do um, like these ceremonies, or like ayahuasca ceremonies, that part of the brain's actually um, taking a back seat. So now you feel connected with everything because it's that part of the brain that separates you from everything. So, you know, probably what you did, you got into that deep state of letting go of the default mode network. Wow. Wow. I mean, that's crazy. Like I mentioned, Dr. Joe Dispenza earlier, his, yeah. the, the recent book I'm reading, he talks about nobody, no one, no thing, nowhere, no time. And that's what you're essentially talking about is the highest day. Um, I wanted to go back a little bit in particular about human performance, because I'm, that, that's a big part of what you do. Yeah. And there was something specifically that I wanted to ask. More so, not more so, I think I actually asked you this at the event when we first met because I run a lot, I do a lot of races, triathlons, nowhere near to the extent of the things that you've done before. But why, why is it, why do you believe that a lot of people are held back and stuck in fixed mindsets when it comes to physical and, and, and mental capabilities? Um. I think there's there's different levels of it. So there's there might be like the the average Joe who had who is stuck in terms of like doing any exercise, and then there's the athlete who is stuck with what's the actual potential of humans, and that's where it's really interesting. Like that that there's a lot we don't know what we're capable of, and so much is because you know of of the lifestyles that we live now. Um, if 50% of the population have a certain condition, they reset that as now that's the new standard, that's the new normal. So, for example, if 50% of the population, um, you know, in, 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 in 2020 is 30 pounds heavier than they were in, you know, 1980, that new weight is now the, the set point. That's normal now. So they just change the set point. So what was considered obesity, you know, back in the 70s is now considered normal. And so we're we're slowly getting more and more deconditioned because we're we're living in discomfort. I mean, sorry, in comfort more. And that makes us weaker. And so there's you know, we don't really know the potential of humans because we have all this knowledge of body adaptation, how to make the body stronger. But we haven't been living in an environment conducive to that. Um, 
But going back to like the average person, you know, what's interesting is that so so the, the biogenic coding that we're talking about, it's it was programmed before our civilization, so before 10,000 years ago, and it was coded for us to conserve energy. So, you know, getting food, you know, wasn't just available in the, in the fridge. We had to go out into the garden that we, it was basically a garden that we lived in. We'd have to go and collect it and pick it. And, you know, it might not be there. It might be difficult. So our body's conditioned to not know where our next meal is going to come from. So it doesn't want to use energy. So when we start exercising, we actually get signals of discomfort because the body's like, ah, hang on a minute. You know, do you really need to use these calories? You know, and the body, you know, is, is, is survival based. So it's like, hey, if you're being chased, you know, or you need to run from something or catch something, then yeah, we'll use the calories. And then if, so if you keep exercising, it goes into that mode. Oh, we might need to be doing this. So then it gives you feelings of pleasure to keep going. And we're amazing animals that we can, we, we can go endurance wise longer than most other animals. Um, but a lot of people give up on exercise because of that feeling of discomfort that we get. Yeah, I was just thinking uh, it didn't feel like that at mile 21 on a, <laughs> no. on a marathon. <laughs> That's for sure. But with regards to everything you just said, I mean, you can really talk about this because you've lived it. You've done those, um, I mean, expedition journey races, what you call them. Uh, and, and in particular, I remember there was a slideshow that you gave at the event I met you at where you were talking about part of the way through of this adventure race. You would become hallucinating and yeah. thought you were seeing a, a tribe or something. And uh, can you Gnomes. <laughs> Right. <laughs> I, I thought I was having a chat with gnomes. Um, yeah, well, in these races, you know, often we go into sleep deprivation. So we, we were sleeping one hour every 24 hours for five, six days in a row. And so the brain doesn't do great on sleep. And what it does, um, it's, it starts, it wants to conserve energy. And so our brain, what it's great at is recognizing patterns. And once it learns that pattern or that behavior, it then codes it. And then we just have to follow that, that, that you know, learned behavior. A good way to think of it is to think of you know, these, these neural pathways as like um, tracks, like if a sled went in snow and it grooved tracks, the first time you're sort of breaking the, the track and the next time um, it's very easy just to slide in that same track. So what happens is when you're going to sleep depth and you're trying to conserve energy, the brain doesn't want to do this all this assessing. So if it sees something um, like um, a, you know, a, a stick and you jump back because you don't know if it's a stick or a snake, there's part of your brain that just got you out of the way, the amygdala moved you back. And then the, the, the rest of the brain, the prefrontal cortex that does the reasoning, has to compare everything it knows about snakes against everything it knows about sticks to decide if that's a stick or a snake. You know, it does it very quickly, but it might be too, too slow to keep you safe. So when you go into sleep depth, that part of the brain shuts down. So you start recognizing things differently. And so that's what I was doing. And I was in such a state of sleep depth. I thought this little tree stump was a gnome. And I'm like telling my teammates like, hey, I'm gonna go talk to the gnomes as though it was a completely normal thing to do. I just lost that reason capacity in my brain. I, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, I can only laugh. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall to have seen that, Paul. Um, as, you were, <laughs> as you were talking about it, it was making me think you've done a lot of work with uh, Hollywood movies where you've specifically worked with actors to help them to utilize their body and mind in a way that can get them through uh, and help them with the roles that they're playing. Um, you've yeah. worked on some incredible movies. I know that for sure. Can you talk a bit about that and the things that you would do or help or implement with with those actors? Yeah, absolutely. You know, so often when, you know, uh, an actor comes to me, there's a very short timeline because, you know, for whatever, you know, they were coming off another movie shoot or, you know, their schedule just got messed up. And so I had to be good at adapting their body very quickly. 
And the way I started to look at it was I, I came from, I started originally training athletes. And so the athletes have seasons. And so my programs were set up for that. So there's the preseason, you know, there's, there's the competing during the season, there's postseason recovery and building up. And so I looked at how an actor performs in a movie and movies are usually, you know, often three months shoots. So they have to not only get this look, so that's like the athlete getting ready for the competition, but then they have to maintain that level, so the athlete's in competition, and then they have to recover afterwards, which has actually got me onto the year program um, for, the, for my members. So I um, have to look at, okay, what's they're going to be their energy level? I need endurance. So I need them to be able to handle stress for a long time. So I need to, I need to condition that. I need them to have a physical look. So whatever role they're playing, whether it's a superhero or whatever it is, I, I, they have to have that look. You know, that's most important. But, and what I do to get there, I, I learned a little trick, which was training the athlete in the style of the character they're going to play. You know, and one, it you know, helps them sort of develop the character and get into that role. But also it helps condition the body. So if you use your mind to create even the physical look you want, the body adapts quicker. So Joe Dispenza actually talks a lot about this. Like if you can visualize what you want, the mind, then the body will catch up to it. You know, they've done a lot of studies with things like um, um, people learning an instrument, like piano playing or something. And one will actually practice on the piano. The other just do mind um, study. And they almost have the same results of learning. So we can connect neural pathways. So I use that idea and create these programs, you know, using the, the mental capacity as well. And then I can get people there much quicker. Um, and also what I do in my program is we combine um, all aspects of health because you can't compartmentalize your health. And so many programs are like, they're an expert in fitness training or they're an expert in nutrition or they're expert in function or mindfulness, and which is great, but they all relate to each other. And so I started studying all aspects of it. And so I can create this, this program that um, balances all these aspects. And let me give an example of why that's important, because you know, if your sleep's not in order, so you're off your circadian rhythm, you're not in sleep, the wrong hormones get released at the wrong times. So you know, as, um, as the sun starts to set and the light turns sort of orangey red, that signals to the brain it's getting closer to, to nighttime. And so it starts releasing melatonin. Melatonin makes you sleepy. Now, if you've stayed up late and now you're waking up in the morning, that signal will be off. And you might have melatonin being released you know, in the daytime. To exercise with melatonin, it's very difficult. You only got a, a, a small percentage of your capacity. So I would have to get those things in order. The other thing that affects hormones is nutrition. You know, your body's not, if your body, you know, feels it's in a state of distress, it will hold on to fat if, 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 if I need to get them lean. And what's interesting about that stress, it, you know, there's, um, our brain does something very interesting. We're coded, like, like I said, this biogenic coding is coded to keep us safe. So anything that might be dangerous, we have a strong um, reaction to it. So if, if there's a loud noise, I'll get flooded with very powerful hormones like adrenaline, cortisol, and it'll make me very alert. And, and, and I'll feel this anxious feeling because my body is like hyped up, ready to take action. The body doesn't know the difference between something physically happening and something that I'm thinking about in my mind. So that's perceived versus real danger. So I can lay in bed very safe, you know, I'd have everything I need to survive. You know, I'm in this hut that's locked the doors. I have food in the fridge. I'm warm under the blankets. And I can think of something that gives me anxiety and I get that full sensation. My body thinks it needs to prepare me to, to flee or to fight or go into a freezing mode. And so I'd have to deal with that too. You know, you can't leave that alone. And these people are not sleeping well. Their hormones are off. They're stressing. They're trying to you know, eat this certain way, and then they're trying to load their strength on top of it. It's a mess. And so that's why it's so important to combine all the aspects of, you know, how humans, what's, what's good for a human, how they thrive into one program.
I find that really interesting, Paul. And what I'd like to dive in a bit more about is what you've mentioned, two things, specifically what you just said about how your brain perceives things, even though your body isn't actually in any danger at all. But also yeah. what you said before about how you would help the actors to think and, and picture in their mind what they're doing or the role they're doing, because I've read a lot about high performance athletes that will visualize the race, exactly how it, the race will go. Can you talk a bit more about the visualization and how you, you can control your body more through your mind? And Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they're, um, I mean, it's, they're, they're running each other. So my body's giving my brain feedback. My brain's, you know, dictating what my body does. And so I use it for two uh, main reasons. We actually train in the style of the character. So that's the character development part. And it, um, it, it helps the body sort of develop that way. So if you think of it like, if the, if, the, if, the, if the time period of the movie is in the 1940s, I'm not doing all these modern sort of um, exercises because one, it doesn't help with the actor, but two, the body will develop a different way. You know, the other thing is like I've done, um, you know, this one movie where the actor had a sword on his back and he had to pull a sword off. If he's done that for years, he better have a really massive right shoulder, right? So we have to understand the character, what the character does, so then we can be true sort of body development to that character. So that's one aspect. And then the other one you were talking to is really um, those neural pathways. So if I believe, so my, I, I can think of something and believe it, it creates neural pathways. And once I have a neural pathway etched in my brain, it's easier for the brain to go there. And so I can start um, um, creating my look just by believing it. And then the body will adapt help adapt to that. I still need the stimuli, obviously. I can't just lay in bed and, you know, think I want massive biceps and wake up with massive biceps. I still have to challenge it. I have to put stress on the body and the body will adapt to that stress, but it significantly speeds it up. It significantly helps it along. So how, hearing everything you're saying, Paul, tell me how important mindset is just in day to day. So we're moving away a little bit from performance uh, athletes, actors that you've worked with. In a normal day, uh, an average person, how, in your opinion, how, how important is mindset? And when I talk about mindset, I mean, leading on from what you just said, but our thoughts, what we listen to with our thoughts, how we control them or how we don't control them. Yeah, I think, I think this is the most important thing anyone can deal with in their life. You know, when, when, I, when I deal with health, mindfulness is at the top. If we don't get that straight, you're going to be struggling. Um, there's, you know, uh, there's many, way, many ways I could, I could come about this. Um, but if you think about um, joy or happiness, really what that is, is a cocktail of chemicals that floods your body. It's equally, you know, uh, the same benefits as um, stress to the to the to the to the ancient body, the Paleolithic human. So it's just another puppet string. But we're chasing this pleasure, right? And so this pleasure, the way these these puppet strings work in humans is they 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 flood us. We get that experience, that sensation or feeling, and then they have to go away. It's impossible. It wouldn't work if we got the pleasure response. Imagine if we did something pleasurable, like if 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 humans had sex felt lots of pleasure and it stayed with them, they wouldn't want to have sex again and our species would die out. So it has to go away. So now what's happening is we have these, we have more uh, experience of stress. Um, the, there's, a, there's an interesting phenomenon with humans. When we feel like we're um, under attack or oppressed or something, we, our, our body reacts in a different way. And, um, you know, I don't know if you've ever flown um, internationally, but you might notice this, that when you fly internationally, they don't board economy class through first class. Whereas in domestic flights, they might do that, shorter flights. Because what happens is a 40% higher rate of aggression if they board economy through first class. 
because walking through it, they go, oh, wait, that's not fair. These people have all this stuff and I don't have it. So now we're angry. And so what humans do, this biogenic trait, they have to hurt someone that they, they feel that they can dominate. And we can see this in all, all um, um, the, the apes, they do this. So if, if in a tribe of, of orangutans, um, one of them, a, a weaker one gets bullied by the, the alpha, they'll go off and hit or bite someone that's weaker to them, than them. So our civilization, just the way it's structured, makes us feel that way. So, you know, what was free, like you talked about um, going to this farm. What's happening, we're eating um, the plants because the plants have absorbed sunlight, right? They're through photosynthesis, or we'll eat animals that just ate the plant. So it's just the, the different degree of this energy we're trying to consume from the plants because we can't convert it. And we lived in a garden that was abundant, right? You know, it's only till civilization came along that I had to pay for this land or I had to go and buy the food before I'd go out and just pick it, you know? So now I'm in a state that where I have to have enough money to, to order to buy this, whatever is sustainable for me, you know? It's like, it's even illegal in California to catch rainwater because it's been commoditized. So there's things like that, that just the way the structure of our civilization has made us in a stress state. So we're starting off in that state. So now what happens when you're in a stressed state, we want to escape from that. So now I want to use these other powerful chemicals, the pleasure chemicals, to even if it's momentarily escape from it. So that's things like, um, watching uh, TV, escaping into TV, or to um, go to the fridge and eat something nice, or drink, have a, have a little cocktail. These are all to get rid of that feeling that's stress. Now, if you think about what meditation is, meditation is focusing on one thing. You can do it through, you know, focusing on your breath, you can do it like Zen warriors and count a mantra. What it's doing is, taking the mind from this scattered thoughts, creating a reality, a perceived reality, to focusing on one thing. So essentially not having a thought. So when you don't have a thought, there's no stress. You're actually in this space void of stress, which is why they say, hey, you can recover so much. 20 minutes of meditation is like taking a nap for an hour, you know, or longer, six hours. And so it's because we're separating from this stress. And now what that is, it's thought. Thought is what we generate. That's the electromagnetic signals we generate. It doesn't exist anywhere. It's not tangible. It doesn't have any matter. So we live in the dimension of matter, right? Thoughts don't have matter. You know you have a thought. Like if I said, think of a pink elephant, you could think of a pink elephant. You couldn't show me you're thinking of a pink elephant. You could represent it in a drawing, but you couldn't show me. So um, these Thoughts are existing in, and they're not tangible. So it's very hard for people to stop their thoughts because we're used to working in a world that's tangible. That's why meditation is very difficult for people. But the importance of it is separating from that network of, you know, these past conversations, these people, you know, from your from your life that are having a chat with you in your head. That uses a ton of energy, and so. We're, we never have um, reprieve from this because we're constantly churning it up. If, if, you, if you walked outside and you verbalized what's going on in your head, people would want to lock you away because you've gone crazy, right? And, and that's what we're doing. We're having this, this, this frenetic conversation in our head, you know, or, you know, um, I've heard it called the, um, the tour guide that's going along, sitting in the back of your head commenting on the world around you. Oh, look at that person. Oh, what? Oh, why did you do that? That was stupid. And it's just this commentary that's going. Now, that doesn't exist anywhere. We're generating it. We're making it up. But it's dictating my behavior. And it's dictating my behavior because I want to um, escape from it. And I want, you know, it's producing these negative feelings within me. It's stressing me out. And so now we're all mixed up because we have this stress that's not tangible. I can't go and like, shut the door on it or, or chop it away, but it's constant. And so that's why I think it's the most important thing to condition the, your brain to develop the ability to not think. And that's, it's called a practice, 
but you, you get better at it each day. It's a practice of meditation, but it's, it's so significant. The, the art of being nothing is, I think, everything. Yeah, I love that. And I'm really pleased that you spoke about meditation. I wanted to bring back that from what you'd mentioned earlier in the fact that meditation is so important and a lot of people don't realize. And I think it's just because we're not in general told. Uh, it's not taught in school. It's not told to you by the government to do. It, it's something that you will learn or come across. But yeah, it's so important because as you said, it gives, or what I find, find is it, it gives you very brief moments. And those very brief moments can start to expand and get a little bit longer, or they help you to catch the tour guide you mentioned talking, or they help you to catch those negative thoughts. And one thing that I really find interesting, and you might be able to elaborate on, is that a lot of the thoughts we have our thoughts we've previously had yes. so we we're going over the same right this is a yeah. new day but we're having the same old thoughts so thoughts cannot be in the present they can only be about the past or the future so being present is not thinking and that's why they said oh be present it means don't think because thinking you're taken off into this fantasy world of the past or future and we're just regurgitating so what you mentioned, this, that um, sort of tour guide, that voice, um, in psychology, it's called the, it's built up or identity. It's called identity or personality, but it comes from the sociogenic and idiogenic traits. Now, I'm who I am because of where I grew up, my culture I grew up in. So I grew up with an English family in Portugal. You know, I was born in America. I came here to high school, lived with the host family. That's why I have my accent. That's why I have my culture. You know, that's part of who I am. Then there's my idiogenic traits. That's, these are specific to me. And they, I developed them because of certain events that happened in my life. And they're usually experienced as traumatic events. They, they might not actually be like really traumatic as, you know, ones, these dreadful ones that you hear about when, you know, um, there's abuse or, you know, um, a lack of, of caring or love or abandonment. It can be something simple like, you know, you're, you're dropped off on your first day of school and that stage of brain development, that infant mind doesn't understand why. And it's like, well, what did I do wrong? Why did my parents abandon me here? And then you make a decision from it. You make a decision of how you're going to survive this situation. So it could be something like, oh, I better be really, really well behaved so this doesn't happen again. Or I'm like, obviously, I'm on my own. I'm going to be independent. I don't need anybody. And that's, I start developing that aspect of my personality. And this goes, you know, um, it happens a lot, many, many times until I, you know, I get fixed. And after like young adulthood in the 20s, 25, we start to get fixed. And that's the default mode network I was talking about. That's where it gets fixed in that part of the brain. And it's, you know, very difficult to um, get away from it because all we're doing is reliving those um, experiences we had over and over again. We're getting very efficient of it, you know, because we've done it so much. So I'm not thinking through, oh my God, do you remember when I wanted um, chocolate chip pancakes and my mom gave me blueberry pancakes? Obviously she doesn't love me. I'm not doing that, but I have triggers now. So if something reminds me of that or reminds me of that feeling I had, and so now I'm reactive to it. I'm defending myself against it. And I'm constantly preparing. You know, there might be a time where I was, I got embarrassed. Like I, maybe I, I did something stupid in school and everyone laughed at me. So now that's coded in my brain as like, hey, that was really bad because um, um, you, fe you felt bad. And I felt bad because it's a risk for humans to be kicked out of the tribe, right? Um, that's a fundamental fear of humans. And so if people are laughing, my peers are laughing at me, it gives me the sensation that I might be excluded and then on my own. And that's a lot of a fear for people is being on their own. And so I am reliving that constantly. And not only am I reliving it, I am looking to validate that belief. So I'm looking for signs to validate that I'm unwanted or I'm alone or I'm stupid or I'm ugly or whatever it is that I have this limiting belief of myself. And I'm just regurgitating that. I'm reinforcing it. And so the ability not to think 
quietens that down. You know, I, I do this weird thing. Um, I had this great coach, um, and <clears throat> he was this 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 monk that helped me sort of get into that wavelength where it was actually looking at that voice as my identity in the third person. And this sounds totally weird, but I started to think of myself as Paul, my identity Paul. And I didn't do it out loud, obviously, because that'd be, be strange if I walked around going, hey, Paul's thinking this. But just within myself, I started to, to, to act like that. Oh, Paul's upset. Paul wants, uh, you know, um, pizza. Paul wants to watch TV. That upset Paul. And what it did, bit by bit, it started to put that part of me in place, meaning it wasn't dictating my behavior anymore. And then I just have a very, very strong practice of separating from that. So I do a lot of meditation. I do actually um, 40 minutes in the morning of quiet meditation. I do a lot of walking meditation where I'm walking and not thinking. And I, every time I don't need to think, I'm basically in a meditative state. I'm just focused on my breath, you know, because we only really need to use our brain as to strategize. We don't need to bring up, regurgitate all this old, hashing out all this old past experience or, or worry that we may have or upset that we may have. It's not valuable to us. So my goal, I have this mantra that I, that I live by, and it, it probably sounds kind of hokey, but it's to need nothing with all my heart. Meaning I want to be, you know, try and come from compassion or love, but not to need anything. Because when I need something, then it sort of pits me against someone else or something else. Yeah, yeah. Paul, honestly, I love that. Everything you just said and, and your mantra as well, that's incredible. I could talk with you forever, Paul. I find <laughs> your knowledge uh, so interesting and so in-depth. Before we wrap this up, there's one thing that I'd like to ask to give yeah. to anybody that's watching or listening to this. We've already spoken in depth about meditation and how important that is. is. Are there any other things that you can, small bits of advice that you could give for yeah. people to be able to implement straight away? I think one of the most profound things you can do is get your life into a rhythm. Because um, it's great for a circadian rhythm, but the body also releases hormones at a certain rhythm. Like the, when you feel hunger, it's usually a hormone called ghrelin. And that gives you the sensation of hunger. It's got nothing to do with when you ate. It's got to do with when you typically eat. So getting in a rhythm. So I wake up in the morning, my brain's coming online. It's coming out of a Delta state. So I do a little tea ceremony. Like I make tea uh, just gently. I do a meditation because I'm already in the theta state. So it's good for meditation. I do breath work. I exercise. I won't eat until later, sometimes 2 or 4 p.m. Um, I stop eating at least two hours before I go to sleep. I, I get rid of blue light um, before I, you know, a couple hours before I want to go to bed. And it, I just set this rhythm and I am consistent with it. And I think that's the most profound way to change your health is to get into these rhythms. And this is what my business is, is, is all about, is about setting these healthy rhythms. So then your health goals become a byproduct of your lifestyle. And you're not trying to just squeeze them in and go in with a sledgehammer cutting things out. You just become healthy. So I think finding a routine and rhythm is, is probably, I would say, the top thing to do. That's amazing, Paul. I think that's really important and, and so grateful and, and blessed that you've uh, given that information to everybody. Um, last thing, where can everybody find out more about you and about Altus as well? Yeah, um, so most of my um, handles are Paul M. Vincent. So on, uh, on Instagram, I'm starting to play with YouTube. Um, I got a website, Paul and Vincent. I'm just building it so it's coming. And then you can find anything about my business on uh, altushealth.com. Amazing. Amazing. Paul, I can't wait to catch up with you in real life yeah, again and, and to carry this conversation on. Absolutely. Truly blessed to know you and thank you for everything, Paul. Yeah, thanks, mate. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate you bringing me on. We'll speak again soon, mate. All right, mate. Take, Take care. care. Bye bye. Wow. Paul is an incredible human. The work that he's done in human capabilities, physical, body, mind, soul, everything. Uh, I've learned a lot from listening and talking with Paul, and I hope you did too. 
And so we'll be back again very soon. Thank you. Bye.